My name is Julian Earls and I want to talk to you for a few moments about change. A friend of mine, Mr. Roberts, telephoned his physician in the middle of the night and said, Doctor, I think my wife is having an attack, appendicitis. I really believe I recognize the symptoms. And the doctor said, Mr. Roberts, certainly you should recognize the symptoms because if you'll recall, I removed your wife's appendix just five years ago. Have you ever heard of a woman having a second appendix? Mr. Roberts said, Doctor, have you ever heard of a man having a second wife? I hope we are all more perceptive of change than was that physician. The change that will occur in the future is as unpredictable as anything. There's this mythical baseball game where after the batter hits the ball, the opposing team is able to move the bases anywhere on the field. So the challenge the batter faces after he becomes a runner is to predict where the bases are going to be so that he can touch those bases. That is not unlike what we confront in terms of the future. Not knowing where the bases are going to be, not knowing where things are going to be, but we have to prepare ourselves to be ready for that game that is going to confront us in the future. So how do we prepare? One way, certainly, is education. It was Emerson who said, the true value of an education is the ability to make yourself do the thing that has to be done when it ought to be done, whether or not you like it. Now, that's the first lesson that ought to be learned. But unfortunately, that's the last lesson that most people learn thoroughly. But we have an opportunity to learn that lesson. And education is more than classrooms and laboratories. We have to be able to think like entrepreneurs. We have to be creative. We have to be innovative. I was hired to be a consultant for a nuclear power plant company. They wanted to locate a nuclear plant in the state of South Carolina. So they hired me to go around the state giving lectures on the biological effects and the environmental effects of ionizing radiation. They provided a chauffeur-driven limousine for me. Well, after the chauffeur had taken me around on several different occasions into the state, moving from city to city, he said to me one night, you know, Dr. Earls, I've heard you give that lecture so often, I could give that lecture myself. I said, surely you jest. He said, no, I'm serious. I said, well, I'll tell you what. They don't know me in this little town we're approaching. You go up front and deliver the lecture, and I'll sit in the back room as the chauffeur. He said, no problem. He went up front and delivered the lecture verbatim punctuatum. As a matter of fact, he did it so well, he finished a few minutes earlier than I would finish when I gave the presentation. At this occasion, the MC stepped forward and said, Dr. Earls finished the lecture a little earlier than we thought. Therefore, we have time for a few questions from the audience. Well, I smiled. A lady stood up and said, well, Dr. Earls, how do you characterize that amount of X or gamma radiation such that the associated corpuscular emission per gram of air at standard temperature and pressure is one electrostatic unit of charge of either sign? Well, I smiled even broader. The chauffeur dropped his head, looked up, and said, in my entire career, that's probably the simplest question I've ever heard. As a matter of fact, it's so easy, I'm going to let my chauffeur in the back of the room stand up and answer the question the ability to think on your feet, the ability to anticipate the unexpected. Those are the kinds of things that will cement your future, that will in fact prepare you for the unexpected. And you have to make some decisions whether or not in the future things are going to be done to you or for you and by or by you and with you. We have to make sure that we understand that that decision is completely in our hands. No one else can make that decision for us. We have to make that decision for ourselves. I remember being asked about the definition of a human being, but I was asked to give it in engineering terms. 
The definition I gave was the human being is a complete self-contained, totally enclosed power plant, available in a variety of sizes and colors and reproducible in quantity. Human beings are relatively long-lived, have major components in duplicate, and science is rapidly making strides toward solving the spare parts problem. Humans are waterproof, amphibious, operate on a wide variety of fuels, enjoy thermostatically controlled temperatures, circulating fluid heat, evaporative cooling, have seal and lubricated bearings, audio and optional direction and range finders, sound and sight recordings, and are equipped with the sophisticated control center called a brain. Now when I was through with that description, it became significant to me for what has been omitted. What goes beyond the mere fact of this robot's existence and turns it into a human being? What makes it differ from such mechanical models as the Viking Lander, the Pathfinder Lander, Spirit, Opportunity, Curiosity Rovers on Mars? The one thing that makes it different is the ability to be creative, to be innovative, to think, to adjust to the unexpected. That's what will make the difference in the future. As you think about that, human beings are able to respond and react, and the robots are not able to, in fact, do that. And we need all of us to think in terms of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics and medicine. Now, you don't have to have a PhD in physics, but you do have, a, have to have an understanding of basic technology, science, things that are happening. Any nation that rises to the stop, top and stays at the top does that on the basis of its understanding and its firm grasp and production in technology. We have an opportunity to do that. You have an opportunity to do that. I'm a runner and the runners have a saying that the will to win means absolutely nothing if you do not have the will to prepare. And that's the key, the preparation, doing what is necessary. It's only logical. If you do the things that you need to do, you will be prepared to handle the situations that confront you. But I give up on logic. In physics and math, there are courses in logic. A student once asked me, how do I reconcile the courses in logic with everyday occurrences? And I said, it gets frustrating to me. For example, why do you press harder on the remote control when you know the batteries are dead? Why do banks charge an insufficient funds fee on money they know you don't have? And if psychics know the lottery numbers, why don't they just play them? Have you ever wondered why they have interstate highways in Hawaii? Have you ever wondered why they have Braille on drive-through ATMs? And I love Western movies. One night I'm watching cowboys jumping up and down on the backs of horses when suddenly it occurred to me, if logic truly prevailed, women would straddle horses and men would ride side saddle. But you cannot let the lack of logic as you observe everyday occurrences prevent you from applying logic to what you need to do to prepare yourself for this future. And you don't have to have an IQ of 160. You have to understand that preparation for the future requires that you believe in yourselves, that you work at doing things. I can is a lot more important than IQ. And I ask you to be like the bumblebee. There's an old saying in physics that the bumblebee can't fly. That according to all the laws of physics and every aerodynamic principle, the bumblebee's wingspan is too short to support its massive body in flight. But the bumblebee doesn't know that. It never took physics. So it just flies all over the place. And that's what you have to do. Be like that bumblebee. The bumblebee flies through brute force. If you look at the aerodynamics of the bumblebee, the wings don't move in synchronization. It just brute force flies through the air. And that's what you can do by preparing, by thinking entrepreneurially, by being creative, by brute force, by your brain power, you can create that future for you. Lastly, motivation. You have to have the motivation to do what needs to be done. 
Let no one tell you that you can't because of your ethnicity, because of your financial background, because you don't come from educated family members. You can do this. I stand here as an example. When I grew up, I wasn't poor, I was poor. I had a pair of tennis shoes once that I had worn so long that the soles were so thin I could step on a dime and tell you whether it was heads or tails. If I could come from there to be able to try to talk to you about the importance of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine in your lives, again, not saying that you have to have a PhD, but you do have to have a willingness to work and understanding of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. You can do these things, but you have to want to do it. You have to work to do it. You have to will to do it. You have to be persistent. It was Calvin Coolidge who said, nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. It is more than that. He also said that genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Talent alone will not do it. The world is full of unsuccessful people with an abundance of talent. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. And that's what I ask you to do. Be persistent, be determined, be a lifelong learner, and embrace technology, embrace your future.